Well, take your Bible, turn with me to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 2, we're going to continue our series in Titus. Where we're picking up in verse 11 of Titus 2. We've done some good singing today, and I just I want to continue with a song. I'm not going to sing it, but it's a, it's a song we all know. The name of that song is Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. This grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been here 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. I tell you, grace really is amazing. God's grace is amazing. And that's what I want to talk with, uh, with you about today. I want to talk with you about when Jesus appears, grace appears. One of the greatest acts of God's grace and kindness to me was 12 years ago when he allowed me to marry my wife, Chelsea. Today's our anniversary, and so I love you, honey. And uh, truly, God has been good and gracious for bringing Chelsea into my life and making me a father, who I'm proud of my two kids who are with the kids right now. What, two kids? Three. I got three kids now. I got three kids now. You're supposed to let, y'all are supposed to remind me of that. <laughs> I'm proud of all three of my kids, okay? <laughs> when Jesus appears, grace appears. So let's look at this in Titus chapter 2, verse 11. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, Instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. Grace is... The unmerited favor and kindness of God. Grace is the gift of God that is given to us as people. Grace is never earned. It's always unearned. Grace is always free. That's one of the things that's so amazing about grace. You don't earn grace. There's nothing you can do to earn grace. Grace is the free gift of God. It's unearned always, never always free, but yet grace is never cheap. Grace is not cheap. Grace came at a great cost. The grace of God given to us came at the great cost of the Son of God coming into this fallen world and giving His life on the cross for you and me. See, it cost God everything to extend to us His great grace and salvation in Jesus Christ. When we, while we were at the convention, there's always a big exhibit hall at the convention. And at the convention exhibit hall, uh, there's exhibits from all, all kinds of places. And that's the highlight for my kids because you go to all of the booths and they have candy at the booths. And they have little trinkets. They have little pen, they have pens and stickers, and they have stress balls. Uh, some of them give out little football. I mean, you just, there's all kinds of things that, little trinkets they give out all over. I mean, there's probably 200 or more uh, vendors and booths there where they were uh, just telling us about themselves and giving out their little trinkets. And 
I don't want to tell that my kids aren't in here, so I can say this. You know, all those things, they're just, they're just, they are free, but they're cheap. They're just little cheap little things. They break. They don't last very long, but, you know, it makes everybody happy to get a little free something, even if it's cheap. But let, let me tell you something. The grace of God is not cheap. It came at a great cost. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, It's for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, but is the gift of God. Not of works, so that no one may boast. There is no boasting in the salvation that we have, that we have earned anything at all. But simply by the favor, the goodness, and the kindness, and the grace of God, He has provided salvation for you and me. And when you receive Jesus Christ into your life and in your heart, you have received that grace of God unto salvation that changes your life. And in Titus chapter 2 verse 11, it says the grace of God has appeared. Appeared, that's an important word there. It means that it became visible. This grace that God has, has come in a person, has been personified, has become visible, has, grace has made an appearance. Grace has made an appearance in this world. It, the, there's a word picture with, with, uh, with has appeared, and it, it's in, in the original language, it's actually the, pic, the picture of, of the sun rising in the darkness. And you've been traveling before, or you've gone out to the beach, or you've been in the mountains, and you decided you wanted to get up early, and you wanted to see the sunrise. And it's been dark all night long, but you're waiting with anticipation, and, and the darkness is there. And then as you look up over the horizon, all of a sudden, finally, the sun begins to peak, and it begins to come up, and all the darkness begins to scatter. And you see the brilliance and the beauty of the bright, shining sun as it makes his way as the sun rises. The Bible says when Jesus appeared, grace appeared, just like the sun coming through in the darkness and rising. You wait in hope and anticipation for that moment, and you know every day the sun is rising. And the Bible says, listen, when Jesus appeared, grace has come and is shining in this darkness. Grace has appeared. Grace has come on the scene and is changing lives. John chapter 1 verse 14. If you know, if you're a new Christian or you've never studied the Bible for yourself, let me encourage you. If you're if you're like, "Hey, I'd like to start reading my Bible." Well, you can be reading in Titus with us as we go through this series and come back every Sunday and see what you've learned and make sure that I'm not off somewhere off in the distance and need correct correcting. But you could also go and begin in John. John chapter 1 and work through the gospel of John. And in John chapter 1 verse 14 it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now that word is talking about that's, that's a title for Jesus. Jesus the son of God. The word became flesh. The son of God took on humanity. He became a man through the birth of the virgin Mary that 2,000 years ago, grace appeared on the scene, stepped into the world. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us. It says, and we observed His glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father. And here's what it says, full of grace and truth. You see, when Jesus came, so did grace. Because with Jesus, the Bible says... He's full of grace, and he's full of truth. It says in verse 11, it's appeared, grace has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. I want you to remember this. Salvation has been provided. That's what Jesus has done by coming to this earth. He came to provide salvation for all of us in this room today. He came and made the way for us to be forgiven 
and to have salvation. Now, why did he provide salvation? Well, he provided salvation because the Bible tells us salvation is needed. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But it says the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus came and he provided salvation for us sinners who are in desperate need of that forgiveness and that salvation. We needed rescuing. We needed saving. And the Bible says you can't save yourself. And you can't earn grace. You can't earn salvation. But salvation is the free gift of God. Jesus has provided it by being nailed on the cross and shedding his blood so that our sins could be forgiven. But the Bible says you must accept it. You must receive that salvation. You receive salvation by trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. By repenting of your sin, by confessing with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead. Trust in Him and you receive. See, we don't earn salvation, we receive salvation. Grace is the gift of God. He has come and He said, here is my gift of salvation to you. Just simply receive me. Receive me. For all people. What a wonderful thing to know. That the people all over this world. Jesus came for them. What a wonderful thing to know today. That Jesus came for you. Jesus came to save you. In mercy, God doesn't give us what we do deserve. You see, what we do deserve is the wrath of God, the penalty and punishment for our sin. We deserve that judgment. The Bible says that God is a God of mercy, and so Instead of giving us what we do deserve for our own actions, God is patient and He is long-suffering. He withholds His wrath from us. Here's what happened on the cross. Jesus withheld His wrath from us and He gave it to someone else. He gave it to His own Son, Jesus Christ. In mercy, God doesn't give us what we do deserve. And in grace, God gives us what we do not deserve. Listen, the grace of God in your life, you don't deserve it. You've not earned it. God has simply, out of the goodness of who He is and His grace, He has provided and given salvation. Grace truly is amazing, isn't it? Truly is amazing. You know, there's three tenses of salvation and we see those. By the way, this is one of the great high marks in Scripture. This, th- th- these verses are a very powerful theological passage of Scripture. I've told you as we've studied Titus that Titus is about doctrine and duty. And we've seen a lot of the duty of how we are to live in a fallen world. How we are to operate in a culture that is in chaos. And how God has called us to live upright Christian lives. Being genuine believers, followers of Jesus that are living for Him. That don't look like the world, but look like Jesus. And so we've looked at all that. And really all of it hinges on this text. Because this text tells us how we can do that in the first place. This text tells us where we actually start at. If we are going to live righteous and godly lives in a fallen and chaotic culture, culture full of sin, we got to experience and know the grace of God. We have to be transformed by Jesus Christ and empowered by Him. He says, The grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people. When you trust in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you have been saved. You have been, a legal term for that, this is a theological legal term, is the word justified or justification. That word justified means you have been set right, 
you have been deemed righteous in the courtroom of God. And he has said, you have been made right. And, and those things I have against you, those sins you've committed, they have been cleaned away and you have been saved and forgiven completely and totally. You have been justified. And so that happens at a point in time in your life when you trust in Jesus for salvation and you believe in him, you at that moment are saved. So I can tell you today, if you've trusted in Jesus, you have been saved. You have been justified by God in his grace. But it, there's also a, a, another tense of salvation, and that is the present tense of salvation. And it's another word, theological word, that we say is be, being sanctified. So you're justified, and now you are currently being sanctified. And, and to, to make it simple for you today, what sanctified means is God, His grace is still at work in your life. His grace not only justifies you, but His grace also sanctifies you. Meaning right now, a work of God's grace in your life, the Holy Spirit is making you, empowering you, and helping you be more like Jesus every day. So you can't live a godly life in a fallen culture if you are not being sanctified by the grace of God in your life. Because it is a work of God in you that empowers you to live in a way that looks more like Jesus than like this world. And so he says in verse 12, he says he instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age. There it is. Sanctified. Being made like Christ. He's instructing us. Grace is teaching us like children. He's, grace is instructing us. Grace is disciplining us. He says we are to deny. He gives us a, positive, a negative and a positive. He says deny and live. God is not only about the word no. Did you know that? Following Jesus is not just all of these restrictions and no, 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 everything's a no. But there's a lot of yeses also. And so he tells you, say no to worldliness and say yes to what's best for your life. Say no to sin and live for the kingdom of God. There's no more powerful an exciting way to live than to live for Jesus. I mean, you look around the world today and everyone wants to be, be a part of some kind of movement. And we'll march on the streets and we'll, we'll do all kinds of things. Because, why? Because people are yearning to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves. They're yearning for excitement. They, people want something to do that they feel like might make a difference. I, I, something in there. Listen. Living for Christ. Living according to God's word. Is the most exciting life you can have. Because it is there that you really live a counter-cultural life. I mean, you, you are able to live in a way that other people around you aren't living. Deny to say no to sin, the lust of the flesh, the, the pleasures of your physical senses, the lust of your eyes, that, that the outward show of materialism, uh, the, the, the pride of life, having an arrogant uh, spirit of self-sufficiency. He says, Say no to these things, but, the middle of verse 12, but live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age. We are in a certain age. We're living in the world today. God has you here today, at this hour, 
at this moment for a reason or for a purpose. God knew what would be going on now, and he has you here for this day. God has a plan, and he says, live today. Live. Live for me. Live for God in this present age. Live with a strong, healthy mind, being sensible and righteous and godly in this present age, here and now. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this age. This is the battle for us today. Do not be conformed to this age. The culture wants you to conform to the culture. The world wants you to conform to the world. Listen, the Bible says, do not be conformed to this age. It was true 2,000 years ago in Crete and in Rome. And it's true today. God says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Of God. It's easy. It's really easy to do what the world does. It's easy to do what the world does. Everyone else is doing it. There's a thing they call herd mentality. My brother said he experienced it, that he took his family to Disney recently his daughter is a senior and they, she got to see they were their choir was singing at Disney for something and so he took it they went to Disney and he said you could just see the herd mentality everywhere it's like it's like everyone's afraid of missing out and there's a big long line over there and everybody's like running getting, they don't even know what they're getting in line for he said he said they're just getting in line and they don't even know like what what they're in line for but just everybody's over there doing it, and, and everyone's afraid of missing out, and, and this herd mentality. And it, we're living in a day where it's easy to lose your mind and not be sensible and not be wise and not be thinking clearly. And the Bible says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the kind of life God has called you to live. To be sensible, you're being transformed by the renewing of your mind. While, he says, verse 13, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So first, we've seen God's grace, and now we see also God's glory. You see it? First, it says the grace of God has appeared. And then he says, we wait for the appearing of the glory of the Son of God. The same way grace came, like the sun rises on that dark morning and the, 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 the night goes away, the darkness flees and the sun shines bright and you see the appearing. Just as sure as the sun rises today, and tomorrow, you can be sure that the Son of God is coming again. He says, listen, not only have you been justified and sanctified, but one day you're going to be, here's the third one, glorified. That's something that's going to happen in the future. That's when Jesus comes back for you and me. And he says, here's what we do. We are waiting. We're with, with great expectation, with a confident expectation, with absolute certainty of the future good that's coming when Jesus comes, we wait. That's what hope in the Bible means. It's an absolute certainty. We know He's coming again. Now, as I talk about Jesus coming back again, it doesn't make sense to anyone in this room except for those of us in here who have trusted in Jesus for salvation. It just doesn't. You're thinking, this don't make any sense. He's going to come out on the cloud. There's a second coming. Yes, Jesus is coming again. 
Just as grace appeared when Jesus appeared to save this world, the glory's appearing when He comes again. He came once to be humble and to die on the cross. He's coming again with His wrath and His glory as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In the Gospels, we see Jesus shedding His blood on the cross. And in Revelation chapter 19, it says He's coming to tread the winepress of the fury of His wrath. He's coming as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's only going to be one kingdom, and it's going to be the kingdom of God. And we'll all worship at the throne, those of us who have trusted in Jesus Christ. And so we have this blessed hope, this confident expectation, Jesus is coming again. And when we think about the fact Jesus is coming again, that should change our attitude and thinking. In fact, I'm going to tell you today, friends, our attitude and our thinking must change. We need to change. We need to get like the early church was. When this was written in Titus, when the New Testament was written, those believers that day believed Jesus was coming back again in their lifetime. I don't want us to lose sight of what I remember growing up in church. I remember hearing that he could come back tonight. I remember hearing he's going to come back in my lifetime. And friends, we got to believe it. We don't know the hour that he's coming. The Bible says he's coming. He's coming when you least expect it. One day, he's going to show back up. And he's going to come out of heaven. And the Bible says when he appears, his glory is appearing. The glory of God. He can come at any moment. I got a video I want to show you, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Just look at him. Josh Carroll, an 8th grader at Lead Academy in Greenville, has no idea what is about to happen. His mother, however, does. Jamon Williams. You see, Josh thinks he is just at another end of the nine weeks awards program, but what he doesn't know is just outside the cafeteria. Yeah, we're going to try to pull it off. He thinks I'm coming home in about three weeks. Yep, his dad, Lieutenant Paul Carroll, is home from Afghanistan. Mom and the school staff planned the whole surprise. Today we also want to pay honor and tribute to another type of service. Now the moment is just seconds away. The final award is for service to your country. Josh and his mom are called up in front of the whole school. Now just watch and listen to what happens next. Please make welcome back home First Lieutenant. <laughs> Dad and son together again. Nigel Robertson, WYFF News 4, Greenville. Wow, there's some. So I want to say a couple things about that. First, I want to say something to the fathers in here. I want you to know just how impactful and important your life is to your kids. Our kids need strong, godly fathers. And you may not realize it, but fathers, your kids are looking up to you. They're looking to you for those marching orders. They want to be like you. Hopefully, they're going to be like you. And I'm sure you know, I have friends that growing up, they said they didn't want to be like their father. Because their fathers, they just weren't good. They weren't good fathers. They had done things that they said, I'm not going to be like that. 
God has designed you fathers that your kids, they are yearning for you to be present in their life. Not always stuck on the TV, not always stuck on your phone, not always off doing your hobbies and the things that you want to do, but you have an opportunity right now to do everything you can do to be present and active in leading the way for your kids and your family. The Bible says, or not the Bible doesn't say this, excuse me. But there's statistics out that when a father is saved and leads his family to church, 90% of the time the family follows him. And it's not like that with anyone else in a family. I mean, the kids can get saved at VBS. That doesn't mean their families are going to be coming with them to church that next Sunday. But when a father is serious about the things of God, the family will be serious about the things of God. There's another reason why I wanted you to see that video. Not only because it's Father's Day and I wanted to encourage our fathers in here. But it struck me of how that boy didn't think his father was coming home anytime soon. He thought he knew when his father was coming. Weeks, maybe weeks and weeks later. But oh, to his surprise. And we love it. We love it, don't we? I'm up here trying not to shed tears. Oh, to his surprise. There he was in that assembly. And all of a sudden, his dad appeared. And he took off. Friend, we've not seen Jesus face to face as of yet. But you don't lose sight and you don't forget and you don't stop believing what the Bible says. Jesus will appear again. He is coming. And like that boy, one day Jesus is going to step foot on this earth, and we are going to start running to him because we see our Savior is back. We don't have time to put off God's call and commission. He's coming again. He's coming in our lifetime. He might be coming tonight. He might be coming later this week. Jesus is coming again. We don't have time to put off the things that God wants us to be about doing. It's time to get serious about God's call. It's time to get serious about God's commission. At the end of World War II, soldiers were making their way back. And many of them landed in New York at the New York Harbor. And there, above the New York Harbor, was a great large sign, and it had these two statements on it. It simply said this. It said, Welcome home. Well done. And those soldiers came back from that war, and they landed at New York Harbor, and they could see the sign. Welcome home. Well done. When Jesus comes... He's going to tell us, welcome home. I'm taking you to the place I've prepared for you in heaven. Welcome home. We're not of this world. We're of the kingdom of God. This place is passing away. This is our temporary residence. We have a home. And he's going to take us there one day. He's going to say, welcome home. And just like that sign the Bible says, we all want to hear the words, Well done, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done, my brother. We all want to hear those words, well done. Let me ask you today, when Jesus comes again and he says, welcome home, is he going to say to you, and well done, 
and well done. Jesus is coming. And so here's what I would encourage you to do today. If you've never done so, join the kingdom of God's grace. Join. Join his kingdom. Trust in him for salvation. Live empowered by this grace that he's given to you. Right now in this present age. Greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. He's empowered you. Live empowered by that grace. And be zealous, be zealous. That's how he closes in verse 14. He says, be eager to do good works. Zealous, be zealous. Be red hot. Be fired up. Be eager to do the things of God. Be zealous. Why? He saved you. He's doing a work in you. And he's coming. He's coming. Don't don't wait till it's too late. The king is coming. Let's bow our heads. Father.